What does the Atlanta City Detention Center mean to you? Well, I used to work as a prosecutor down in municipal court. So for me, uh, it meant seeing primarily African-American men coming in by the busload, literally, uh, into the jail and standing before judges. And at that time, uh, the jail was holding people who were picked up on felony charges. So we would have first appearance hearings. So they could be charged with a violent crime like murder or, or rape or um, a felony. And we would hold first appearance hearings. But for me personally, it was um, this symbol of mass incarceration. And thankfully, we've been able to turn the tide on that. And there's an opportunity for us, for it to be a symbol of so much more, so much more that's needed in our communities today. You've talked a lot uh, and you've written a lot about how your experiences as a child and what your father went through and what that meant for your family, how that has colored your view on the criminal justice system. Obviously that predates the detention center, but how has your experience as a child and what your family went through, how has that affected how you view this detention center now? It gives me a context that many people don't have. So for me, I know what it's like to have a family member who's charged with a crime and, and to be held in prison because I did experience that as a child with my father. Um, but also, I know what it's like to have family members who uh, do something as simple as not renew their tag. Or um, I remember as a child having this experience being in the car with a family member who had a dealer tag on the car. Um, young child in the car with me, I was a teenager at the time, and that family member was taken to jail. And, but for the fact that I was in the car, that young child would have been taken into defects custody. So I, I, I have so many personal stories of, of knowing people, of having family members locked up on something very simple, but then it creates this domino effect. You can't pay a traffic fine, so you're held in jail, and then you lose your job, and then you can't pay your rent, or you can't pay your child support, and, and then it just creates this never-ending cycle that is not just a story of my experiences, but of many people throughout the community, especially in the African-American community. So, obviously, as I mentioned, you have spoken with so many people on, on all sides of the future of the jail right now. What would you like to see happen? What I like to see is that this massive facility, 500,000 nearly square feet facility on Peachtree Street, the address is actually a Peachtree Street address in downtown center, uh, down, downtown Atlanta, no longer be the center and symbol of mass incarceration, that it become a symbol of hope for our communities, literally and physically. So we made many decisions that have gotten us to this point. Many years ago, the city of Atlanta stopped holding first appearance hearings when the traffic court and municipal court were consolidated. That reduced the jail population. I eliminated cash bail bonds uh, during my first year in office. That's what I mentioned. When people are picked up on petty offenses and they can't afford to pay a ticket or a fine and they are held in jail, we eliminated cash bail bonds uh, so people weren't penalized for being poor. And then during the family separation crisis, we ended our relationship with ICE. We were making millions of dollars a year holding ICE detainees and I couldn't get any reassurances that we weren't going to be complicit in the family separation crisis. So that leads us to where we are today. 500,000 square foot facility on Peachtree Street, downtown Atlanta, 17 stories holding about 30 people a night. It's not the best use of taxpayer money and there's so much more that we need in our communities. We need a place where people can have 24-hour daycare. We need a place where someone can walk in and get drug counseling and, and support services, where they can get their GED, where they can get vocational training. There's an opportunity to transform this jail into that place. I wanted to ask you about May 2019. You stand out in front of the jail, surrounded by advocates and Chief Labatt at the time, 
and you announce that Atlanta is no longer going to be in the jailing business. Mm -hmm. What was that moment like for you? Uh, it was, it was a, a big moment because so much work had been done and this vision was finally taking form. And so to stand there with the advocates and make that announcement uh, it was encouraging in so many ways. And, and you think about how much the world has changed since 2019. We had so much support and goodwill for that. Uh, people were talking about criminal justice reform and wanting to do things differently. And unfortunately, with the COVID crime wave, it almost seems as if uh, we've done a 180 from that moment, that people have, have gone from the idea of, of criminal justice reform form and, and, and providing support and social services back to the 1990s, 80s model of lock them all up. Uh, and that's not where we need to be in 2021. Why do you feel like that's happened? I think it's based on where we are. Uh, crime is up across the country. Crime is up in Atlanta. And people have a tendency to deal with what's in front of them. But the reality, even in addressing this, this COVID crime wave, we've got to deal with the systemic issues that have gotten us there. So we do those immediate things regarding policing and, and making sure we are expanding our camera network and hiring more officers and those immediate things. But until we address those systemic issues, uh, this won't be the last crime wave that we will experience as a city and as a country. And that seems to be the thing as I listen to the various city council work sessions and public safety work sessions on this. The thing we, that constantly comes up, whether it's from people calling in for public comment or from council members themselves are, with a crime wave like what we're seeing right now, with a generational crime wave in Atlanta, how can we possibly close a jail? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, it's a fair question to ask, but I'll, I'll give you the example of my father. Uh, my father was not a hardened criminal. He, had not been to prison before, didn't have any record. Uh, but my father chose to sell drugs, and this is something born out of an addiction issue. So you think of, of that story, how many more people have addiction issues? And before they make this extreme deci decision to do something unlawful that completely goes against who they are, uh, how about we have a place that they can walk into and they can access support services and access opportunities that will allow them to make other decisions. And the issue with, I've, I've heard before, there's overcrowding in Fulton County Jail. Well, the reality is Fulton County has had an overcrowding problem for decades. They were under a federal consent decree. And before I announced, our vision for transforming the jail, I had a conversation with Fulton County on their interest in the jail, and it went nowhere. Mayor Reed had a conversation with Fulton County. It went nowhere. Mayor Franklin had a conversation with Fulton County, and it went nowhere. That's as far back as I know. I don't know about the previous mayors. Um, so it's not, uh, it, it's, it's, we've not been able to come up with a solution and a partnership over three mayors. So at some point, we have to make decisions uh, based on what's best for the people of Atlanta. And that decision has been for us to transform this jail into a place where people can access what they need. And hopefully Fulton County won't continue to have an overcrowding issue. And you think about where we are with COVID. Courts effectively shut down. Uh, Many people are awaiting trial in Fulton County, but what I had proposed to Fulton County in a letter of intent was let's agree on what we can agree on. What are the things that we, are agree, we agree are needed? We had a transition program in the city jail where men would go out to work by day, come back in at night, they could save up money, and when they transitioned out, they had full-time jobs with the city of Atlanta. If you have people in the Fulton County Jail who can qualify a program like that, send us those inmates. If you have people who are in need of support services or social services, mental health services, let's talk about that group of people. 
But just to say, we want to transfer 500 inmates into your jail, uh, it, it's putting a Band-Aid on a gaping wound. Fulton County has to take responsibility for where it is with this jail and where it has been for decades. Take responsibility for that and work with us as a partner on what we can agree on. In the last few months, the Public Safety Committee has met and they voted to hold the justice reform plan that your team submitted. And they voted to move forward with looking into a task force that Councilmember Bond submitted for potentially working with Fulton County in some way. Obviously, you've expressed how you feel about the idea of partnering with Fulton County. What do you make of the council doing these two things and essentially putting yours on hold and talking at least about moving forward with a plan that could run counter to what you want to do with the jail? I would suggest that Fulton County take, uh, or City Council take a look at the city charter, first of all. Uh, the mayor, and the mayor only, is the one who negotiates agreements, intergovernmental agreements, and commits the city to agreements. So they can have any number of task force that they want, um, but those recommendations will not be binding recommendations. And on top of that, we've already had a task force. We had a 50 plus member task force of community members, of uh, internal stakeholders within the city to discuss and reimagine where we are as a, um, as a city and where we are with this detention center. So this is not a plan that I, I just pulled out of the sky. This is something that we've given a lot of thought to and a lot of work to and for Fulton County, uh, for city council uh, to try and slow it down is really just that. They are slowing it down and any recommendations that they make uh, will not bind me as mayor and will not bind the city. So I would hope that they would put their energy, energy towards getting Fulton County to try and work with us as partners on those things that we can agree to work on. Obviously the City Council cannot move forward on an agreement like that without you. Can you close a jail without City Council? Well, we're going to continue to go through the legislative process. There are things that I can do as mayor and there are other things that we will need City Council approval on. But meanwhile, taxpayers are still paying for correction staff. Uh, I think the last count we were about two to one correction officers <laughs> per inmate. Um, and it may be even more than that. We're paying millions of dollars to operate this building with 30 people. 30 people, 500,000 square feet on Peachtree. It's not a place for a center of mass incarceration. I would imagine um, one of the big challenges you face as the mayor of a large city is that you have people in various offices who might oppose your ideas, and then you have the people who are outside City Hall who are trying to, you know, trying to, um, you know, who are advocates, in this case advocates for closing the jail, who, you know, they're trying to gather momentum and, and gather strength for what they want to see, and they're telling you that you're not moving fast enough. Mm -hmm. So you've got it coming from both directions in this case. I know in talking with the advocates who I spoke with, there seemed to be a general critique that since COVID, since the rise in crime, they have not seen you out publicly talking about this enough. What do you make of that critique? And do you feel like you can be doing more publicly, outwardly, to talk about this? I talk about it all of the time, but I, I don't dictate the news cycle. So if the entire country and globe is dealing with a pandemic, then that's what the news cycle uh, and reporters like you will ask me to speak about. If the entire country is dealing with a, a presidential election, that's what I'm asked to speak about. But every opportunity that I have and I'm given to speak about the jail, and in fact, even during the election cycle, I talked a lot about the jail. It's difficult to remember that um, because of, of where we are with COVID, et cetera. But I talked about it because part of Joe Biden's criminal justice plan that he rolled out was with input from Atlanta. And we talked about funding, having funding in place for cities like Atlanta that had alternatives, um, criminal justice reform as, as a focal point and doing things like transitioning the jail. So I did speak about it a lot, 
But I think when it's an issue that's at the forefront of anyone's mind, um, you know, there's an expectation that it should be the only thing that you talk about. But as you can imagine, as mayor of Atlanta, there are a number of issues and challenges that I'm speaking on at, at any given time. Um, the jail is a very important one, uh, but I've given my voice to it every opportunity that I've had. Is there more that you can do as far as trying to sway counsel and council members? I think that's where our advocates can be helpful. Um, I think sometimes the anger and frustration is misguided because it, there are parts of this process that are in the hands of city council right now. So I think to, to put the same level of expectation and pressure on council that has been given to me at certain points, I think would be most productive. I know I interviewed uh, Felicia Moore and she said that while she agrees with a lot of what you've done in terms of reducing the population of the jail, she doesn't see a reason to close it at this point and, and opposes closing it at this point. Obviously she'll be one of your opponents uh, in this year's election. And I'm sure you would say that your preference is to win the election and have a second term and be able to continue this process in 2022. That being said, do you feel a certain pressure to get this done or get a date on the books before election day this year? I think it's important and it doesn't surprise me that she disagrees. She disagrees with just about everything that comes out of the mayor's office and city council. And she's done that for the past 20 years, but uh, that's not what leadership is about. Leadership is about making difficult decisions. Um, it's about showing people and explaining to people why it makes sense. And the difficult decision has been to push forward with closing the jail. Because again, there are many people, many people don't even understand what the jail is. When they think of a jail, they think of a place where hardened criminals are held. Well, the reality, these are people charged with petty crimes expired tag, broken taillight, litter, littering, those type of crimes. Um, these are not rapists and murderers that are being held in this jail. So it certainly has been something that I would have loved to have completed by now because we began talking about this at the beginning of my term. Um, so it remains a priority for our agenda and you don't know how elections will turn out, but it's my hope that if I'm mayor or, or if someone else is elected mayor, that they will really take a look at why we made these decisions and what it can mean for our city. I've, uh, I've listened to a lot of these council uh, public safety work sessions, and it is a lot of hours. And a lot of those hours are public comment. Much of the public comment I hear about this particular subject seems to be spurred on by, by emails from Mary Norwood to her constituents in Buckhead, or, or one-time constituents in Buckhead. And uh, a lot of the calls are coming in from Buckhead saying, you know, crime is out of control and people need to be locked up. And, you know, they've never seen Atlanta like this. What, what do you make of that particular strain of criticism from that particular community in our city? Well, I think it's unfortunate uh, because even uh, with our crime numbers, uh, the people who are charged with felonies, the person who steals your car or, or breaks into your house will not come through our city jail. They still go to the Fulton County Jail. So uh, part of it is, is intentional misinformation to communities and to inflame emotions and, and to get people to this place of lock them all up. Well, that's not a solution. And mass incarceration across the country has shown us that's not a solution and a deterrent to crime. You've got to deal with the systemic issues that lead people to crime. While you address crime, which is very real, I call it the COVID crime wave, this has all happened after COVID. This is related to people being out of work, people dying, people being in, in homes potentially in, 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 with in unsafe relationships. All of this spills out into our streets. Uh, but meanwhile, we can't ignore the systemic issues and challenges that have never been addressed. And so I think that um, it's a very old trope. 
lock them up, lock them up, lock them up. That doesn't surprise me coming from her. Uh, but I would hope that our city council is more thoughtful. And I, I truly believe the majority of people in Atlanta, once they understand what this jail is, what we do and what we do not do, who we hold and who we don't hold in this jail, when people understand that, they understand what we're trying to accomplish. So I've been working on this project now for several months, and I'm trying to understand how at this point does this jail, how at this point does, do we get to a closing date? And what has to take place, and how can it take place quickly enough? How, you know, how can minds get changed? How can things get turned around? Does it require the end of the COVID crime wave? Does it require a, some kind of return to normalcy? And I'm just curious, from your perspective as the mayor, what does a timeline look like for you? What, does, what are the events that take place to get you to actually turn the key metaphorically and close the Atlanta City Detention Center? You know, it's unfortunate that this has gotten uh, caught up in the political fodder um, because it's not about politics, it's about our communities. So once the legislation is approved by City Council, it's gonna be about a 15 month process. So every day that city council sits on this legislation and, and uh, some council members go through the theatrics of appear, appearing to be tough on crime to appeal to voters in certain neighborhoods that they don't normally appeal to, uh, with every day they do that is another day loss in our ability to offer services and things to our communities that are needed to help us not experience another crime wave in this city. And I will say, uh, the Bear Institute came out with a report recently that said, the city could close the jail in three months with the legislation, if the legislation went through. Obviously, your timeline is five times that amount. What, well, what it's are a, the... It's a, so it's a process. So the closing is one thing, but we will still have detainees even if a limited number, like 30 detainees. So we've got to make sure we have a place for those detainees because there will be someone that we may have to hold uh, based on a hold in another jurisdiction, for example. So everyone's not going to be eligible for a cash bail bond. Um, so for the 30 people that we still have to hold, we, we've got to have some place to hold those people. And part of the process, it, it may be renovating other buildings in the city to hold them. It, it may be um, with the public safety training facility that will be built in the future. It may be holding them there. It may be an agreement with another municipality to hold these detainees. So there are other things that have to happen. Uh, we can't just close it, turn off the lights and walk out. We've got to make sure that these other parts of the process are transitioned as well. I'm curious for you, and obviously much of the, you mentioned that, that a lot of the criminal justice reform policies that have helped reduce the population came before you took office, but much of it has come since you took office, including cash bail reform um, and the ICE contract and everything you mentioned. If we get to a point where this, you know, where there, there's just no agreement on what to do with the jail, or maybe let me phrase the question this way. How important is the closing of the jail to your overall impact on criminal justice reform in the city of Atlanta? Well, we've done a lot. Even without closing the jail, we, we've done a lot. Um, but obviously, this is a, a huge piece of it. It's a cornerstone piece of our criminal justice reform. So it's it's my hope that it happens and that it happens soon. And if it be the will of Atlanta voters that I, I not be mayor after the next election, then it's my hope that whomever they entrust their vote to will continue to keep this as a priority because it's important for our city. A refrain I've heard from advocates is, you know, as long as there's space in a jail that's open, there'll be people trying to fill it. Is that a fear of yours? Um, it, it's something that I, I know has been a refrain for quite some time. And Sheriff Labatt is a jailer. He's a 
Think of a prison warden. That's, he's a jailer. That's what he does. He oversees people in jail. So it makes sense that he wants people in the jail. Uh, Council Member Bond used to work in the jail. He has a brother who works at the jail. So it makes sense that he wants the jail to stay open. That doesn't surprise me. People just have to be more thoughtful about this and get outside of the election year politics of it and what the personal interests are. Remove the personal interests and think about what this can mean for our communities. I was interested when I interviewed uh, Council Member Bond, he, obviously you know his position on the jail, but I, I, I was somewhat surprised that he almost came out and said that the, the narrative that a lot of people have put out there, that this jail was essentially built to house homeless and poor people before the Olympics to get them off the streets. He kind of said that was, that was true. He kind of said that you know, when he worked in the system that you know, before major conventions that that was the old joke, that, you know, or that was kind of like the running thing people would say is like, oh, I guess like, you know, they're gonna, you know, this is what's gonna happen now. I mean, do you, is, is there truth to that narrative? Um, I can't speak to the intent behind it, but I can speak to my experience as a prosecutor there, that you saw poor people, you saw homeless people, a lot of homeless people in the jail. And there are even some who I know have said it to me, uh, that it's their belief that's, that we need to keep it open because we've got to have somewhere to put our homeless population. But in 2021, I hope we're, we are more thoughtful than that. Uh, the jail is not supposed to be our solution to our homeless population or to removing people from the street that may make people feel uncomfortable. The solution is to that is to provide support services, to provide supportive housing, to provide the resources and the network of support that allows people to break the cycle of homelessness or, or any number of challenges that they may have. So while I, I've heard that, I don't doubt that it's true, that that is how the jail came to be. Michael Bond would know, he, he was here when it happened. Um, when you know better, you do better. And what we know that temporary fixes are just that, they are temporary. Now that we know better, we need to think about more permanent solutions and approaches. Last thing I want to ask you about, um, you know, I mentioned the, the critiques from some of the advocates about, about your, your work on this, and, and largely they, have been in, they, they were incredibly positive about what you've done to get to this point and, and everything that's taken place. Um, you know, wh what do you say to folks like Marilyn Wynn right now and, and the people who are on the ground and, and trying to, from the bottom up level, push this thing to the conclusion that everybody including yourself, seems to want. Our administration has done more than any other administration in the history of this city to get us to where we are on, on criminal justice reform. So I understand the frustration because for our advocates, it's not happening fast enough. But they have to think about how far we have come and how long they've been trying to make this happen. Uh, decades. Uh, and so in the few years since I was sworn in the office, we've made tremendous progress. Now there's still more to be done and we still have a ways to go to get there, but we've made progress. And I can tell you uh, before I became mayor, there was no progress being made. There was a lot of talk and a lot of frustration. The progress is being made and we're gonna keep pushing. What haven't we talked about with this that, that you feel is important that you want to mention or anything else on this? That so I want people to uh, take a step back and um, really understand, again, what this jail is and what it can be. And it is difficult when we are in the midst of a, a crime wave to think outside the box, but even if every criminal in this city were picked up, everyone who robbed somebody, everyone who shot somebody, everyone uh, who broke into a building, they would not go to that jail. That's not w what it is for. It's not who it's for. Um, so let's think about what it can be. It can be a place that people 
will have a physical place to walk into and receive services and support services and all the things they need uh, to make better decisions. And when we are able to accomplish that, then I think we will see long lasting changes in our city and our communities. Are other cities watching? Other cities are, are definitely watching. We've had philanthropic support from across the country and interest in our work um, because it's such an innovative idea, innovative concept, and people are looking at Atlanta to see if we can get it done. And my concern again in this election year, uh, there are some who are attempting to de derail it so that it will be a personal loss for me. It won't be a personal loss for me because we've done so much. So I, I hold my head very high on what we've done, but it will be a loss for the people of Atlanta who need all of the things that I've talked about. Did you think you'd be talking about this three and a half years into your administration when you first started running for mayor? You know, I knew it would be a process. Um, doing hard things can be hard. So. Uh, but also I think of words of ne Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. Um, I, I knew that it would be a process because that's the way government works. Um, you don't wave a magic wand and it happens. Um, but none of us anticipated the social justice movement. None of us anticipated the pandemic and all the things that have come in the aftermath of the pandemic. So, you know, I, I, I didn't have a, a set time frame because you'd be foolish to do that um, with anything that you're trying to get done in City Hall. Um, but I, I, I hope that it's soon that we're able to take the next step.